So uh, telling all these things, I would like to step into the specific focus of today's uh, workshop, uh, short stories. Uh, even before that, would like to throw a question, what is a short story? Then you might wonder why we should learn such basics. What is the reason? Uh, knowing the stories in, is enough. I always see students have kind of a, you know, um, yeah, kind of a decision that stories would enough would be enough. Stories would take me to the other end. Yeah, we would meet the other end of the syllabus, uh, but still, are we good at you know answering questions? Don't ever think that I'm rather specifying, rather emphasizing technical aspects of uh, literature much. But I kindly request you to go through the past papers and check the way that examiners uh, set questions. Knowing the story would kind of uh, make you flabbergasted, confused sometimes. If you knew the story only, you're not supposed to, you are not able to answer the questions. On the other hand, um, um, yeah, I will rather present, before that I would uh, present another, uh, I would present one of my experience when I was studying literature. I thought literature is by having quotations, knowing the story perfect and I'm um, qualifying uh, myself with the, with the quotations and the content matters only. Uh, but I still remember, even though I was very good at, you know, quotations of many of the poems, I rather could by heart them, right? I was uh, good, I mean, I was really good at by hearting. So what ultimately happened was a failure. I could not rather uh, focus on the thesis of the questions. So uh, I therefore emphasize the fact, it's very important to focus on the structure, technicality, and basically, the philosophies, the writers, otherwise uh, literarians include in their stories, along with the story. We can't rather forget that there should be story. I mean, we can't forget that uh, the story is also there. Without that, we are, we are not able to get examples, right? Stories to get the example. The philosophies and all the technicality, technical um, expertise of a writer comes to the story. We can't forget about that. Therefore, I would like to take you a journey with, this, with the topic, what is a short story? And if you examine certain past papers, you get questions of this nature. Uh, select the best short story or else the worst one in your syllabus and justify and write an evaluation. Why do you select this as the best? Otherwise, why do you select that as the worst? So I found it in national level exams. I find it in uh, term tests as well. Therefore, <clears throat> your structure of the question is suggested by the examiner in the thesis. If you are not able to examine, examine and exemplify the qualities of a good modern short story, you become a failure in answering. Because you should not forget that there, there is kind of big, big allocation of, uh, uh, there's a huge allocation of mark for structure. Structure is very important. So let's move. Ask this brevity. I would. I don't like to ask this question from you because you all know that brevity is shortness. In kind of big terms, it's brevity, but it's short. Short stories always, you know, compared with a novel. Novel is one genre. Short story is another genre. We know uh, the the very word novel gives us a sense that there are many pages. Uh, on the contrary, uh, short story is a short one. It's it's something something very very odd when I say short story short, but technically we have to realize that the I mean making a short story short uh, is kind of an expectation of the writer. There is kind of technical expertise in a writer in making a short story short. Example, giving a story. Suppose that anecdotes life story, you come out and you present your story, perhaps after, after a vacation to one of your friends. All right, the person might say, okay, I don't have time, make it short, give, it, give, give me in, in a brief form. Yeah, you start giving it in brief form, but you always become failure because 
people who speak a lot would not be having kind of an, a kind of a practice to make stories very short. So uh, then brevity, otherwise making a short story short, understanding a short story is also kind of uh, challenging. I say uh, uh, tall things are there. Superficially, we find a lot of things the writer tells, but underlyingly, there are a lot of undercurrent facets, minimally perhaps presented on the surface, but maximum is perhaps undercurrently hidden. It's almost like iceberg theory. Then I go to the next one, conciseness. Conciseness means limitedness. In short stories, we get brevity, conciseness, and under conciseness, we get single setting. Setting means place and time. That is the minimal definition I can provide you. And number of characters in, connect, in connection to short stories, in comparison to short stories, that is limited. I would like to take uh, action and reaction and compare brevity and conciseness. So what do we find in action and reaction? We find a little bit of, uh, I don't know whether it, whether action and reaction is a very short story. A fine number of pages compared to Cat in the Rain, Hemingway and Chitra Fernandu. When we compare them, we find Chitra Fernandu is uh, more extrovert in her story. She uses a lot of vocabulary, a lot of incidents, a lot of sentences, a lot of expressions. And she is very descriptive in her writing rather than uh, Ernest Hemingway. So then in, if there is a question, to justify whether this is a good short story, this is kind of fruitful short story, you can have a kind of a comparison, how brevity becomes uh, one of the criteria. Then conciseness, uh, single setting, when it, when it comes to single setting, we know some stories uh, start from somewhere and end up with somewhere, all right? So basically we should find a story should happen, uh, a short story should happen at one setting, single setting. And there should be uh, limited characters as well. In action and reaction, we find find considerably higher number, but focus characters are limited. But when it comes to a novel, I would like to suggest you to think about test test of the abuse. You find huge number of characters, right? We find huge number. Sometimes we can't retain them in the mind in, in the mind as well. And what about the settings? Test starts somewhere, moves to somewhere, comes back home and moves back. Likewise, back and forth, flipping of settings would be kind of prominent, you know, uh, notice that we find in novels. So you have to notice, focus on that as well in analyzing a good short story, especially in good modern short stories. And there is single plot. Single plot means single story, single story, right? So in novels, we find multiple stories. So it's almost like my hand, the main plot is there and connected subplots are there. Subplots are to support the main story and they are deviating from the main story sometimes, but always there should be a connection to the main story. But in short stories, we don't expect to have subplots. So in analyzing whether the given short story is the best, otherwise the worst, make sure that you go to that facet as well. Then, of course, we know that short stories uh, start abruptly. There is abrupt entrance. It means there is no smooth rising of uh, the story like in novels. Novels never disappoint us with a sudden entrance. Then, can you imagine why I did not like short stories when I was little? Because I was kind of a perfectionist. I did not like to have kind of a media restart. And sometimes the story uh, ends up, I think I have not included that, you can write that as well, uh, open ending, okay? Ah, yeah, it's there, open ending. So in short stories, we find open ending, the ending is not clear. Example, uh, if it is Cat in the Rain, if it is Hills Like Five Elephants of the same writer, I always suggest read more about Hemingway to understand Hemingway. Uh, when you read more, I mean, if you have not read, please read Feels Like Fight Elephants as well. There we find kind of really open ending, right? We don't rather, uh, we, we can't rather come into a conclusion. We keep on rather assessing what happened, what happened at the end. There's a girl who is to abort a baby. Uh, she doesn't like it, but the partner wants her to abort the baby. 
but the story ends up without giving that much of clear attitude whether she's going to do the abortion or not doing the abortion. Somehow that he was the writer was good at passing her his own dilemma, the confusion to the mind of the reader. We start thinking about, we start taking the burden of Hemingway in assessing whether um, whether the character, otherwise the character Jig has done the abortion or not done the abortion. It's to do the abortion, not to do the abortion. So, some or the other, abrupt, abrupt entrance and open ending was not really, uh, I mean, I was not a huge fan of short stories because of these two. When I was little, I was not in a capacity to evaluate the ending. I wanted to put everything into a, like, a nice basket and wrap it nicely. I got disappointed repeatedly when I found certain stories are started and ended up nicely, uh, ended up uh, somewhere in the middle. Okay, so I now understand with my growing knowledge, I understand that it has kind of a serious meaning. Writer has more to do with the story. Equally, the reader has more to do with the story. So the assessment of sometimes the entrance and the end, um, uh, ending of the story might be with the, uh, the reader. The reader has uh, kind of more involvement, right? Reader perhaps becomes one of the characters and reader assesses what happens, what is to happen? What if this happens in this way? What if this happens on the other way around? Likewise, we move on. We move on thinking about that sometimes uh, when the open ending given in that way, after perhaps one year, two years, after 50 years of your life, uh, you might give a proper solution. And again, I promise the solution I gave to Hills Like White Elephants in when I was 30 was different. 35, it was quite different. 40, it was rather different. 45, I have a kind of different definition. I'm more than 45 now. I have quite different definition now. It works with me. It works with my experience. So I kindly invite you think about this. Knowing the story is very, very important, but uh, rather applying all these theories in the story and having kind of a structure about the story is rather important. In the examination, you will not be confused. You will not at all be confused. Uh, when you have kind of structure in your mind. Okay, suppose that you learn Evelyn today. If you can rather think about Evelyn, was there brevity? What about conciseness? Was it an abrupt entrance? Was it an open ending? Why is that? So then you are quite ready to accept the challenge in the exam. We know we struggle with time in the exam. If you have kind of parcel, otherwise, compartmentalized knowledge regarding each and every work, literal work in the first paper especially, you move on. You have rather, you can rather manage time because you don't uh, retain in thinking and thinking. Okay then, the next is slice of life. A short story is a single incident and it's a kind of slice of life. It's kind of specimen, a little experience, little example of life. But we all know when we check blood, a little sample of blood, that blood sample is able to rather uh, tell a lot about our biology. That sample is strong enough to tell a lot about our biology. A short story is also like that. A short story, even though the term is short, it is multifaceted. The story has kind of centralized attitude regarding uh, a society, but when you rather it's almost like an onion. When you peel off, peel off, peel off, you get a lot and you get a lot of layers as well. So the reader usually gets the onion, starts peeling off. Okay. So the last is single impression. Now this is taken by some uh, evaluators. Some people say that this is not there, but knowing the typical uh, definition is important. Single impression at the end of a story is very important in connection to short stories. I prefer to take you to action and reaction and its end. What is it is end? We start thinking about Lokunanda. We start evaluating uh, Lokunanda's character. We start you know, analyzing Lokunanda's character. 
we uh, walk along with uh, Mahinda's definition about Lokunanda's character. And at the beginning, what was your uh, assumption about Lokunanda? What was your feeling about Lokunanda? I know that it was a feeling that I too had. I, at the beginning, I was rather having kind of sarcastic view about Lokunanda's character. And I had kind of parallel Lokunanda's in my life as well. So I started, you know, uh, paralleling and thinking about uh, the mocking situations I experienced with them. Uh, and ultimately, I started traveling with Mahinda's narration. And in the middle, I started, you know, changing the attitude about Lokunanda. And finally, I found Lokunanda, personally, I found Lokunanda uh, had been a sympathetic character. I had sympathy. I did not feel that I should be vengeful. I did not feel like getting revenge from old, otherwise, you know, weak Lokunanda. Did not want to actually. So when I rather question certain uh, readers of Chitra Fernando, especially action and reaction, uh, they too rather agreed and they said, yes, it was kind of, uh, I started sympathizing with Lokunanda. It's kind of uh, Manusha Sobhava, right? Even though right, we, uh, hate people, we hate people, we try to rather corner them and all because of their particular character qualities. Ultimately, we come to understanding, realization. They are, I mean, they are also consequences of life. They had reasons to behave like that. So we should rather forget and rather uh, proceed with them. So actually, we, I personally started proceeding with Lokunanda. Lokunanda is with me now. I did not want to forget and rather expel Lakunanda from my experience, calling that she was kind of a, uh, she had been a villain, uh, that I did not want to rather forget about her. I don't know. I lately started loving Lakunanda as well, because it's another chapter of life in people. I don't know what will happen to myself, your mother, your father, your grandmother, perhaps you, after many years, after many, uh, what do you call that, decades, so people uh, start thinking about this and you can take a little, uh, you can take short notes, but I promise to send this as a PDF to you. But if you really want to keep you active, you can take down notes. Yeah, when studying a short story, as I said earlier, try to categorize them and try to build up a structure and remember it. Uh, this is kind of a uh, practice I had been having when I was, uh, when I rather used to love reading. When reading, I started, you know, having kind of psychological categorization. What, are, what does the writer tell about the society? Does it tell about something about economy? Uh, it tells about politics as well. Yeah. So my mind ultimately let me help me by the end of the story yeah the story had kind of almost little layers of society this is another perspective of analyzing literature actually right we have different perspectives of analyzing literature so this is one perspective we look at the particular literary work as if the society is presented in the story okay there are many sometimes you know people focus on literature for the language, for language. Language is literature. Through structures, it formalism like in structures that we attempt to uh, understand the characters. In. So we are going to discuss about them as well. But basically, think about these five facets. I always emphasize these uh, five facets because there's kind of a tendency of giving questions from one of these areas, otherwise, amalgamation of one or two areas. Let's rather focus more about that in later slides. First, think about the first one, social facets. What are the social facets we all encounter in a, yeah, forget about the story. So life story, you are the protagonist and uh, your parents are the, uh, we'll say, it can be villain, it can be supportive characters, whatever. So uh, if your story is there, think about the social facets you can include in your story, like society, Family, marriage, love, then religion, culture, and your education, health. Okay, all these conditions fall into um, the social facets. 
Now, if I discuss about action and reaction, you find, don't ever think that I'm rather talking about action and reaction. I take that as an example only. My future slides would definitely explain about Evelyn specifically. In action and reaction, we talk about family. Family and how uh, multiple families, example, not the nuclear family, right? When you find uh, how other people uh, contribute to the concepts of family, how a boy derives that idea, how the boy uh, perhaps comments about that idea, Mahinda comments about that, how Mahinda rather sometimes takes it uh, sarcastically. Why should these people interfere me, intervene my affairs? So such social matters are there. We have to find them. We have to categorize them. If you are a good student, even when you read a novel, you perhaps take a little book and write these uh, topics on top, like what are the social facets? What are the economic facets? And when there is kind of example, you can feel the book. You can take them and feel that. It's almost like you kind of do kind of woodwork. Ultimately, you get a collection of information categorized information about the literary work. So uh, I don't know whether I rather take you on a wrong journey. I'm actually talking about literature for study purpose. Literature for entertainment purpose uh, is quite different, right? That we are entertained with the story. We perhaps do not go for such you know, technical categorization when we enjoy a story. I think that you can understand what I'm what I'm trying to tell you. Watching a movie for literary purposes and watching a movie for entertainment purposes. They are quite quite different. So I always tell you, read the story, read the short story for entertainment purpose. Enjoy it first. And after that, you should not forget enjoyment would not rather meet your end of the day, right? So you have to think about uh, the further facets as well, like education, uh, meeting the exams, and so on. For that, of course, you need that. Then we can go to the second layer, economic facets. Uh, does the story tell about economy of that particular demography? Uh, example, if it is Kamala Markandaya's uh, Nick Tennessee, what does it tell about economy of people? Is, is, I mean, do you find kind of economic transformation of that area? Uh, night, like in Twilight of a Train, in your O-level syllabus, you found uh, old Japan got transformed into kind of new Japan, how they started valuing money more than uh, the previous life, right? Post-war Japan and pre-war Japan. In pre-war Japan, they did not rather care about money, but now uh, they are unable to rather neglect money. So such economic transformations should be, uh, can be there in stories. You have to focus on that. And what sort of economic classes, whether there are rich people, poor people, middle class, lower middle class, and uh, whether there's economic inequity, for example, money is uh, perhaps centralized in one particular family, others are rather deprived of the economy, uh, like in tests of the abuse, rich and poor, the social uh, you know, economic categorization is given in a very beautiful manner in the story. And even in the Nick Dynasty, we find the same case scenario. And economic hypocrisy, like in Nick Dynasty, uh, this was his character, how he rather uh, you know, tries to show his upper hand in front of poor people. So such information should be detected, okay? I always tell you that you become kind of a researcher. Make a research. Forget about your study first. Make a research. And make sure that you confirm this information first. Okay? Then you feel quite, quite uh, strong, confident in meeting the exam. Next is a political facets. What are political facets? Then you might say, Evelyn, what political facets do we find? Even though Ireland was in a political chaos at the time that the writer presents these stories uh, in Dubliners, we find that he is really good at you know, hiding them under a curtain. On and off, we find uh, uh, certain examples, certain symbols only, but we don't find that much of uh, politics in them. And what if uh, we discuss about Nick Dynasty? It's a most chaotic time in India, but 
there is no mentioning about uh, uh, government ruling party and the rulers nothing is there but aftermath after effects of uh, india i mean india's uh, political chaos is presented in this underlying way therefore um, you might be having a question why this man is telling that political facets should be taken into consideration this is why i say politics can be of two types in the world first is macro politics if you do not know you can note down that so yeah so the messages i got on the website uh, macro politics what is macro politics what is micro politics the second one is micro politics macro politics macro politics is the facet that we usually see in under the term under the name board politics like parliament constitution uh, ministers voting election and all these other this macro politics right uh, the second one is important more important micro politics how one entity works on another so there is control evidently there is control from one to other one to another if there are two ants there can be one con one ants control uh, specified on the other so this should be noted example your friend perhaps controls you you never know that psychologically you are controlled sometimes your dress the people that you should associate uh, with must be i mean might be controlled by the uh, friend then unknowingly there is kind of control over you political over you there can be parental micro politics parental control how parents control and what about gender politics one woman i mean woman man politics all right so nature becomes politics so in nature according to charles darwin it says that survival of the fittest is the theory that he emphasizes in his theory of evolution there we find predation prey as a polity like expressed in design by robert frost we can't rather avoid it everywhere we find politics so that is why we say that every human being is a political being so find out politics especially in lokunanda's uh, sorry action and reaction uh, lokunanda's kusuma's control how the power inversion inversion shift power shift lokunanda kusuma then in the second half we find kusuma lokunanda lokunanda kusuma kusuma lokunanda so power inversion political i mean micro political aspect of power and how the power is exchanged reversed should be studied and think about uh, such matters in connection with the story we are going to discuss today as well then the next one is interpersonal facets they are relationships what are the ways and means a writer presents relationships in a story okay then what are the relationships you can find a hell of lot of words like uh, family relationship otherwise there are siblings romantic relationship nuptial relationship otherwise corrupted relationship degenerated relationship likewise yeah, you can just type on google and you know google is there ask google google will give everything so almost like god now so find out what are the words you can use in terms of defining relationships google will nice to tell you so then the last one is intra personal facets inter and intra inside you inside a person like emotions attitudes huh? so feelings of a person what sort of feelings are expressed what sort of feelings are uh, moving the story what feelings are diverted from this to the other okay so such feelings emotions attitude and psychologies of people should be studied in a story so there are, you find society outside society inside you as well in a story so it's important because as i have observed the questions are especially essay type questions can be categorized under these facets some may ask question from a social facet if it is about uh, about psychology of a person if it is analysis of relationship so we go for the other layers as well sometimes it talks about how this man's uh, power works on the other person 
example, if it is a father and Evelyn's relationship, what politic is there? Father's control over Evelyn's uh, um, psychology. So we have to think about that as well. So let me take you to the next level. If you have problems, you can send them to your uh, chat. So focus of the story, focus of any story can be measured with this. Suppose you get a book and write all these. Okay, you take Evelyn, you write social facets, economic, political, interpersonal, intrapersonal. Okay, you write all the facets, you copy down all the facets. Okay. Which, which title carries more information? For, for example, I have noted uh, in Evelyn, we get social facets. We get economic facets as well, political facets as well, relationship as well. But in my case, I find there are a lot of emotions, attitudes, psychologies. I will write a lot, huge list about the final one, intrapersonal facets connected to Evelyn. Then I can think about the main focus of the story. There can be one main focus or multiple main focuses as well. It can be society and psychology as well. But it's kind of primary judgment of a reader. Whether the writer has more focus on the society, more focus on characters, relationships, if not psychology. So it's kind of a self, I mean, kind of research. So start thinking about that. If there are people who are going to sit for the exam next year, you have more time. They can think and assess more about that, right? <clears throat> then, <clears throat> sorry about that. Yeah, more about this. I need to think about uh, this light. This slide <clears throat> may tell about the tool of communication in a story, in any story. So again, please don't misunderstand. This is not only for short stories. This can be for any analysis of any genre. Okay, language becomes a tool. Okay, example, I have some ideas. I should rather put it out through language. It's kind of meaning, rather mean of communication, I'm sorry. So in pondering about this, about language, this is kind of very important because the story, you know the story, you know the structures, you know everything. But if there's a question connected to a language of the uh, literal world, study of language, you have to be very, very specific, specific about that. Language is understood, language is not understood. Sometimes I read answers like that. Language is simple, language is complex. That is, you know, far below of the expected level. You have to be rather focused on, and you have to be a little advanced in commenting about language as well. So the first point I rather focus is the degree of formality. How formal the language is uh, presented in the story, whether it is highly elevated, otherwise slangy, communicative, otherwise colloquial language that we use in our day-to-day -day conversation. So I would like to take one example from the, your poetry syllabus. Walk back to Elizabethan literature, the two poems, sonnets, and think about that language and think about the language you find in explosion. You find you can understand the degree of formality and how uh, first two are rather formal, rather elevated and when it comes to the last poem, kind of postmodern poems, you find language is more communicative, language is uh, our own user-friendly language. We, anybody can understand that language. So we have to understand whether the writer uh, paves kind of a good examples to understand the degree of formality of language. Then we have to think about the dialects. What are dialects? Regional varieties of a language. Now in our stories, do we find dialects? Yeah, in action and reaction, we find the Sri Lankan dialect of English. Okay, and 
Sometimes uh, in tests of peer reviews, we find different dialects, right, of the same English, even though it is, it happens in uh, Victorian England, we find different uh, sort of language, right? How people use different language uh, may characterize the social uh, hierarchy as well. Then use of grammar. People use correct grammar, people use wrong grammar sometimes, you know. Sometimes deliberately the writer makes it, otherwise it can be, the mis can be a mistake of the writer as well. Okay, uh, it can be the uh, poetic license of a person, it can be kind of unknown, somehow the other grammar, use of sentences, complete sentences, and whether the sentence is not a completed one, should be observed in studying language. And again, guys, think about this as another help for you to understand unseen paragraphs. In analyzing unseen paragraphs, language helps you a lot. Okay, in deciding characters, characterization, relationships, sometimes emotions of people, you need to analyze language. Then you just can't write it, okay, this character is this without having kind of technical support. You have to provide kind of support. Why do you say so? Okay, that is that's kind of golden rule in literature. You can tell things. Telling things is very important, but it's not important, not enough, right? You have to prove what why you say that. It, that also is very important. Then use of punctuation and vocabulary, they are also very important. Selection of vocabulary as well. So uh, I'm going to talk about this further. Um, then the next is dialogism. Is a technique. Dialogism. So I have given you the references as well. Once you receive this, you can rather go through and find out more about them. Uh, it's the interanimation, intercommunication, usually how the intercommunication make, I mean, put out uh, the character qualities of people. How, suppose when I talk to you, when you talk to me, and if we rather print it on a paper, if we, if we get the transcription and rather print it, so what happens when you analyze that particular dialogue, my character, your character can be roughly guessed, okay? So this inter animation is very important in verbal communication. And analyzing that is also very important because they derive meanings always, especially when it comes to Ernest Hemingway's uh, short stories. You find dialogues, all right? You find dialogues and dialogues are very, there is no, there is nothing to, not, nothing to remove from those dialogues. We all know that say, uh, William, sorry, Ernest Hemingway, uh, Hemingway's language is quite important, quite important to study. And again, it's very economic in expression. Every word is important. Every full stop is important. Therefore, I again suggest you think about this area as well, how dialogues play a major role. In the story uh, we are going to study in Evelyn, what dialogue, what role the dialogues play. That's also very important. Okay. Then this is another important area how language divergence change of language of the same speaker display displays the character's divergence characters change this is specifically noted in othello in your syllabus how othello's language changes throughout the course of the plot and how it is started in this way like with ardent very loving, sometimes lustful language and how it becomes a rather imperative, commanding, cynical sort of language may discuss about the character change of Othello. If you remember, doing all levels is not a must to do all levels. You have to keep that as well in mind. But there was a drama called Twilight of a Craig in your all level syllabus. I just take that as an example only. Uh, if you examine the character and the dialogues of uh, yo-yo he, he repetitively uses the term sweetheart my love my love my love but by the end of it we find that he doesn't use such language that inevitably displays how the character attitude psychology and everything is diverted into a different direction how he has become a different personality so uh, in especially in sto short stories think about that because we have limited number of 
tools. What is a tool in a short story? It's a verb, it's a language. Limited language is there. With, within that particular limited language, you have to rather find out, research and find out what changes of the characters, uh, what changes of the characters are displayed through the words, expressions, perhaps verbal or nonverbal expressions, the characters display in the story. It's very important to understand. Okay, so think about that, how language divergence, character divergence take place. This can be rather noticed in action and reaction. When you examine Lokananda's and Kusuma's dialogues of how our inversion takes place, right? Uh, I don't know whether this is going to be kind of new term to you. Length of a word, length of a piece of vocabulary. Uh, whether this word is a long word, short, medium sized word or a long word. How do you think that idea? Does it matter? Basically, make I'm creating tone and mood. The length of a word is uh, something very important. Monosyllabic words, disyllabic words, and polysyllabic words are to be studied, especially when it comes to uh, unseen paragraphs, uh, analysis of unseen paragraphs. You can utilize this particular technique. In poetry, also we find the same technique, right? Uh, technique utilized in poetry as well, right? Monosyllabic means thing. I mean. Short words like go, catch, okay? only you, you rather change your mouth in, uh, you change your mouth once only, right? The second one, ka, la, ka, la, there are two syllables. Polysyllabic means more than two, like intelligent. They are considered as quite longer words. So there are certain meanings created under these techniques. If I take you to Jane Austen, one of my favorite novelists, uh, if I take this line from Austen's uh, language in Pride and Prejudice, for what do we live but to make sport for our neighbors and laugh at them in our turn? So I will let you understand, realize how the length of a word matters here. Let me count the number of syllables we get in the chain of words. Four, single syllable, monosyllabic. What do we leave but to make sport for our... Look at the term neighbors, neighbors. The number of, uh, we say, uh, syllables, and that is different, and laugh at them in a term. When you analyze this line, you can imagine the writer has kind of a deliberate decision to make a kind of a long word inside inside the, inside the uh, uh, monosyllabic chain of words. So then what can be the exception? What is the reason for that exception? The term neighbors is used to give kind of illumination to that word. It's, it's almost like this. When there are short people in an assembly, you are the tallest and you are actually noted by everybody, right? You can't rather hide yourself. Say you're, you are specific because of your length, I mean, because of your uh, height. So similarly, it can be used as one of the techniques in writing. And again, further, I tell you, when there are a lot of monosyllabic and disyllabic words, the rhythm, otherwise phase of language is faster. If the action is a faster one, if the writer rather deals with kind of a quick action. I take one example from your O-level syllabus, uh, the terrorist he is watching, that it deals with kind of timing, right? Kind of a countdown. In Evelyn also we find the same because Evelyn, uh, even though it's kind of a narration is a lengthy one, uh, very, um, we rather surpass a very limited time. Okay, that fast, uh, otherwise fast countdown of time can be illustrated with mono and disyllabic words in a bunch. So when there are a lot of polysyllabic, otherwise longer words, the pace, the speed of uh, the language 
is slower down. And gives kind of very serious tone as well. Tone can be suggested with kind of very serious uh, melancholic one with a lot of polysyllabic words. This technique can be utilized in poetry as well. Think about that. Okay. So uh, still I'm analyzing about language and sentences. This is also something important. Sentence as one of the unit, one of the units, I'm sorry, one of the units, uh, one of the expressive, otherwise communicative units. Okay. There we have to think about whether these sentences are simple ones, compound ones, complex ones, otherwise fragmented sentences, verbless sentences. I've given examples for you to see. Simple sentences are short, okay? It gives very short beats when you speak. I went to the market, I bought some vegetables, I came home. It gives kind of connection, but it gives kind of very simple, rhythmic, effect to the uh, story. Uh, yes, now I'm there. I will explain what tone and mood means. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Tone means the speakers, the tone is connected to the speaker. I speak, I speak. Suppose that your mother speaks to you. That is her tone, okay? It is with the production the producer of language. Mood is created in the listener. The mood you get with your mother's word. All right. Tone usually is connected to the writer. When you read a literal text with, the, with all these techniques, kind of a tone is created. So that is transferred into you as a mood. Example, if you are reading about a funeral, if you are reading about a wedding of a good friend okay these two uh, discourses would give you um, would give you kind of different moods first one a sad one the second one is a happier one writer too had those intentions as well writing an obituary notice okay the writer has the intention of creating that sort of mood in the reader they are connected to wedding the writer has a has an intention of creating such a mood in the reader uh, I wish you got an answer now up there. Thank you. And if you have questions, please send them to me. I can go for further explanations. Uh, mostly in my capacity, right? I do know a very little, uh, I do have kind of very little knowledge. I thought of you know, sharing with you. Okay, then compound sentences connected with the conjunctions we find it gives kind of a continuation of an action this is nicely used in poetry how a continued action is suggested in poetry through compound sentences uh, during this li little limited time i'm not able to explain all but think about this make a research find more take literary work and think about them okay and do not Take, I mean, do not be story readers only and do not be storytellers in examination as well. So examiner has given you kind of a powerful role as a researcher, as a learner. Okay, be your own learner, find out more. So if you rather request more about these areas, so we have kind of a learner group now, a huge learner group. Okay. If you can suggest me, if you suggest me, I can rather work on these areas as well until you, until you meet the examination. And yeah, I should rather be thankful that I, I'm placed in, a, in an institute like the RESC, Regional English Support Center, uh, that I can support you having, I'm not paid for this anyway, but uh, without getting any payments, like I can support you, right? These have no um, ulterior motives. If there is any request, we can get ready. Perhaps you have to give, give me uh, perhaps one or two days to get ready and we can have we can build up kind of casual conversation regarding them. And uh, it cannot be sometimes very formal like this, but uh, informally I can answer. Otherwise, use your WhatsApp group uh, and develop it as kind of a learner group. I always believe um, Advanced level examination is um, 
not only the study it's about blessing of nature as well there is someone looking at you when you do something good you get you receive something good i have kind of firm belief regarding that when analyzing results people who got a passes people who got b passes and people who failed last year as well so the the extremity of work that had been carried out. so that is expected by nature as well because you are rather reading about the humanity if you can't become a human if you hurt people if your journey ends up with a lot of uh, uh, complaints from people about you or like a couple of people mean so camera they know if you if people cry crushed on your feet so uh, nature would not bless you all right so sharing is very important share this be a meaning to the subject i always emphasize this fact if there is something you have found please share it in the group i'm not going to close that group until you meet the exam so i'm going to include certain uh, um and again if there are any uh, academic in this forum please make sure you uh, send information to otherwise send the knowledge especially connected to literature okay to the group use it as kind of a study circle so uh, if you need uh, administrative purposes i can give that as well to you okay right i move then complex sentences basically search google and search what complex sentences i gives kind of complex mood complex yeah mood in the read it uh, the writer attempts to create kind of a complex tone as well and it gives more melancholy more more serious language in complex sentences and what about fragmented sentences you get some examples like example under the bed is not a full sentence right it's a fragment it's a portion of a sentence right you find especially you find them in july speaker if you carefully examine july speaker's language you find a lot of fragmented sentences connected to july's character that tells you something right that tells you something about the intelligence otherwise education uh, knowledge about english okay and uh, yeah perhaps whether the writers whether the speaker's language whether english is the first language of the speaker or the second language of the speaker if not it's a foreign language of the speaker you can note all these uh, when you study the sentence structures then verbless sentences that too falls into fragmented sentences uh, and again when you find disturbed psychology when you find disturbed psychology your language becomes disturbed example why do i use uh, mm, uh, uh, like disturbed i mean uh, expressions that to show that i'm disturbed that is my psychological disturbance sometimes writers use such poses such expressions to show that the character is disturbed then you have to think about that you have to quote them as well okay we find a lot of expressions like that think about it even in evelyn and the latter part even though there is not no such huge dialogues can imagine that think about connotations and denotations as well what are connotations what are denotations i explained here um yeah denotations are the direct meanings that you can derive from dictionaries like thin and slim slim and skinny okay when you examine them when you rather when you search this word in dictionaries slim and thin both give almost similar meaning but what are the connoted meaning connotated meaning it's perhaps the decision uh, taken by the society after long usage okay uh, it's kind of associated meaning right example slim and thin slim is more positively connotated okay positive but uh, thin is more negatively uh, painted right so what term do you think that you'd like to be used if you are a skinny person you like to be called skinny otherwise you are like to be called slim and what about hot and uh, cool hot and cool two terms which which offer you different meanings 
uh, same meaning, same con denotation, but rather contrasting connotation. Like his school is called in literature, in examining language, think about connotations and think about denotations writers deliberately include in writing. This particular information would definitely support you in analyzing unseen paragraphs. You have kind of technical list of technical terms. Analysis is not technical terms, don't take me wrong, but you need to have kind of basics. Okay. Uh, the, uh, why reading comprehension is different from analysis of critical reading and otherwise unseen paragraphs. In your all of us, you had paragraphs. If the writer asks, okay, who is this woman? Then you have to write the direct information. But on the other hand, in unseen paragraphs, unseen poetry, you have to go beyond that and think beyond that. Okay. We discussed about dialect, so I'm not going to tell, discuss about that again. Dubliners by James Joyce. Uh, please don't leave. I'm going to give you a five minute break. And after that, restart the session. Um, if you have questions, you can send it to the WhatsApp group. Otherwise, I can send it to uh, the chat. And please don't leave the group, uh, leave the uh, uh, meeting.